Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke, Ready with an Answer. Uh, this will be part five on a series. Uh, uh, the subject is Roman Catholicism. Uh, if you have not seen the previous four episodes, uh, they are available on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'll, I'll recap very briefly what I've already discussed. Uh, the first question was, uh, uh, is, is it really a problem? Is Roman Catholicism really a problem? Or should we just accept Roman Catholicism as a true sect of Christianity? Um, I examined that and uh, the conclusion is that no, it is a very serious problem. We cannot accept Roman Catholicism as a, a true biblical Christianity. The, and then in part two, the question was asked, uh, is it a cult? Uh, a cult is, uh, uh, as I define it, is uh, something that is represented or generally understood to be a part of Christianity, but in fact is uh, seriously flawed and uh, really not Christi Christianity at all because of their false doctrines. And uh, not only did I conclude that Roman Catholicism is a cult, but it is, in fact, the largest cult in the world. So that should tell you how serious this problem really is. Uh, and then in the third uh, video, part three, uh, I discussed the origins of Romanism. Uh, when I say Romanism, I, I'm referring to Roman, the Roman Catholic religion. Uh, the, in the origins, we, we showed that uh, it really... Uh, is not uh, based upon biblical Christianity, but it was it was based upon um, the Emperor Constantine uh, bringing Christianity into the fold in in Rome, accepting it, but mixing it with all the pagan religions of Rome. Therefore, it uh, it is uh, uh, really a pagan religion with uh, a little bit of Christianity uh, mixed in. Uh, we showed that we showed the historical record of how that all happened. Um, and then uh, in part four, uh, I discussed the, the atrocities of the Roman Catholic religion. The, uh, I recommended that you read the, the book Fox's Book of Martyrs for a more complete uh, uh, explanation, uh, if, if you have the stomach for it, because it is very, very uh, explicit. Uh, explaining the horrible, torturous deaths that uh, the early Christians endured uh, from the Roman Catholic religion. Uh, so those people who wanted to believe in biblical Christianity did not accept the teachings of, of Romanism. Uh, the Roman Catholic religion was notoriously uh, would uh, torture them, kill them, and steal their property. Uh, and that is well documented. Uh, and then we, we talked next about the uh, personal conduct of many of the popes. Uh, the, the pope in, uh, in Romanism is supposed to be the uh, Christ representative on earth. Uh, and uh, if he is the head of Christianity, as they say, uh, the popes historically have been a very bad example. Uh, uh, and uh, so watch part four if you want to understand the, the horrible behavior, personal conduct uh, of many of the popes. Now today, this is part five, and uh, many people are probably anxious for this one because uh, now I'm actually going to discuss the tenets of Romanism, or the, the doctrines that the Roman Catholic religion holds. Getting a little warm, better turn my fan on here. Okay. Okay, there's a brief recap. But now, let me go into the actual uh, heresies, the, the false doctrines of Romanism, and tell you when they were established. Because what you're going to find out is that uh, um, these false doctrines of Romanism 
uh, are they're certainly not biblical, and they certainly are are not. Uh, uh, we're not in the very beginning of even Romanism. They were gradually brought in over a period of centuries through the uh, the orders of, uh, of the popes. Uh, okay, let's start off with uh, in 310 A.D. Now that's the fourth century. Uh, that's uh, you know almost 300 years after Christ. It's it's uh, over 200 years after the last apostle John's death. And uh, that's when they, uh, it says, of all the human traditions taught and practiced by the Roman Catholic religion, which are contrary to the Bible, the most ancient are the prayers for the dead and the sign of the cross. Both began 300 years after Christ. Okay, prayers for the dead. Uh, I had a, family member die a few years ago who had professed his faith. Uh, he was a Roman Catholic. He grew up as a Roman Catholic. And uh, he was a, a brother-in-law, but I felt more like he was a real brother to me. Uh, and, and he and I had many conversations explaining the difference between Romanism and biblical Christianity. So he understood it and he did profess his faith in biblical Christianity and uh, rather than Romanism. So uh, I know that uh, he is uh, in the kingdom of God with our savior right now. Uh, but I was quite insulted when uh, another person I know who is a, a Roman Catholic was discussing uh, my brother-in-law's death and they said that they would pray for him and I said pray for him why in the world would you pray for him his, his, his fate has been settled nothing's going to change it now he put his faith in Jesus he's in heaven and uh, she said well you know, I'll, maybe he's in purgatory you know, and, you know, I'll pray for him. And, and, and that, see, this prayer for the dead, there's nothing uh, biblical that uh, supports that. Uh, we, we, there's no reason to pray for the dead. But we cannot change. Once a person passes over from, from life into death, into eternity, nothing can be changed. There's no, what is the purpose of praying for the dead? unless you do believe in Romanism and you believe in purgatory and you believe that if there's enough prayers and candles lit and various other things, uh, masses, services held in their name and contributions made that maybe that, that will get them out of purgatory and into heaven, but that's all, none of that is biblical. So prayers for the dead began about 310 and then uh, the sign of the cross. Uh, I'm sure everybody has seen this. If, if, if you're not a Roman Catholic, you you're, uh, should be aware of it. They say, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Or that's how they start and end a prayer. And they give this sign of the cross uh, all the time. Uh, you, you'll see people doing that publicly. And uh, that would be wonderful if, uh, if they were biblical Christians and they were proclaiming the cross and but uh, this sign of the cross, there's, again, nothing in the Bible that supports the sign of uh, people doing this sign of the cross. So we're going to find out that these various practices of Romanism are not supported by any scriptures. They are just dictates by men. And Jesus warned about, uh, you know, the dictates of men, the traditions of men. And these popes are just men, uh, even though. Uh, a Roman Catholic believes the Pope is infallible and that whatever they say is uh, the word of God. And if they say something even contrary to the Bible, then the, the Pope's words are, uh, con are of the power to overcome the Bible. But uh, as a biblical Christian, I, I get my truth. I base all my beliefs and conclusions on what the scriptures tell me, not what a Pope tells me or any man. So prayers for the dead and the sign of the cross began about 
300 and 310 AD. Wax candles introduced in the church. That started about 320 AD. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, many times people will want to light a candle and go into the, I hate to call it a, a church, but the, the Roman Catholic building, they call it a church. Uh, people go in there and there's a whole bunch of candles and you can light one and you make a donation. And, and uh, by making a donation and lighting that candle, that is going to somehow help someone Again, these, this is part of prayers for the for the dead. So this is not biblical. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find in the practice of of uh, uh, these lighting candles in that way. That came into practice three ten. It's about three twenty A.D. Um, and then about three seventy five A.D. Uh, they brought in the veneration of angels and dead saints. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a saint in the scriptures mean, simply is, means a believer in Christ, someone who is born again, say, believer. A anybody who has uh, put their faith completely in Jesus for their salvation, uh, they, uh, they are a saint, according to the Bible. The saint is not a status that you earn based upon your greatness, based upon you know how hard you worked uh, in the church, uh, or if you performed any miracles, as the Romanism says. But they they declare certain people uh, who have been Roman Catholics that they are saints if they uh, if they've done some really special things that they qualify for that status, but. In the Bible, it says that every believer is a saint. So if the, the typical person in the world does not believe in Jesus as their savior, almost everybody in the world really has put their faith in themselves. Uh, by putting your faith in yourself, that means that you're believing in your own ability to please God and please him enough that he accepts you and you get to go to heaven. All the religions are the same. They all teach this merit system. And if you're good enough, God will accept you. Uh, but in biblical Christianity, uh, it is, we, we learn that we must not put our faith in ourselves at all. We, want, we must change our mind about that, put no confidence in ourselves. Instead, accept that everything we do is uh, useless. It's uh, vanity. It's, it, it cannot uh, earn us salvation. And, and once we understand that, we need to transfer our faith from ourselves to put our faith completely on the Savior, Jesus. And uh, we, once we understand that, he had paid for all of our sins, and sin is no longer the issue. We don't go to heaven based upon how much or how little we sin. Jesus paid for all the sins. And he raised himself from the dead, proving that he has the power to give us eternal life. So when we put our faith in Jesus, he gives us this gift of eternal life. That's biblical Christianity. Uh, but so when they say, that, when they started this practice of, um, veneration of dead saints. Uh, I reject the idea that the saints in, of Romanism are saints at all because they don't even believe this basic core doctrine of Christianity that uh, salvation is not by works but it is by faith alone in Christ alone. So, but they, they classify certain people as saints and they venerate them. They even pray to them. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, we on the uh, the rearview mirror of, of our car, we had hanging from there a St. Christopher's medal. You know, because St. Christopher was supposed to be the uh, patron saint for safety. He was going to protect us from getting in an accident. So uh, 
first of all, they're wrong. They think they don't understand what a saint is, and we certainly are not supposed to put our faith or pray to uh, saints, uh, the saints, any, anybody that's dead. Uh, and also a veneration of angels. Uh, so you'll see statues uh, uh, in, in these Roman Catholic buildings. I'm trying not to call them churches. Maybe I'll think of another name for them. But um, you'll see plenty of statues there of angels. They venerate angels. They venerate uh, what they call saints, the dead saints. And then that uh, began about 375 A.D. And then about uh, 394 A.D., they introduced what they called the Mass uh, as a daily celebration. It was, that was adopted in 394 A.D. Uh, basically, what they're doing is violating what the book of Hebrews warns against, and that is... Uh, it, it says that Jesus died once and it's settled. He paid for our sins. There's no longer a need to have any more sacrifices. So in Hebrews, I believe Paul wrote it, and he's warning the, um, the uh, Jewish believers that they must stop doing these animal sacrifices of Judaism because Jesus was the final sacrifice, the only real sacrifice that succeeded in paying for our sins. Uh, so, but the Roman, Romanism, what they do is they practice this mass or massacre every day. Uh, most uh, Roman Catholics, uh, if they are religious, they go at least once a week on Sunday and some go daily and attend this mass. And it's a, it's a, it's a reenactment of the, uh, the, the, the death of Jesus all over again. And uh, it's, um, again, we're not supposed to, we're supposed to remember him. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. But they've taken it uh, much further, and they, they believe that there is an actual um, eating of Jesus' flesh in the communion and drinking of his blood, and it's literal, and they consider it to be an actual death of Jesus again, a sacrifice. Then in, in 431, that's when they, the worship of Mary began. Mary, of course, was the mother of Jesus, and the use of the term mother of God as applied to, was applied to her originated in the Council of Ephesus. Um, now, a, a Roman Catholic uh, always refers to Mary as the mother of God and they even have a prayer that refers to her as Hail Mary, mother of God on, and then they go on and on and uh, the, the scriptures don't say anywhere that Mary is the mother of God and God is eternal so he cannot have a mother uh, uh, he, he, Jesus was the mother of Jesus' humanity. Jesus had two natures at the same time. He was uh, completely a man, and he was completely God. But Mary was the mother of Jesus the man. She was not the mother of God. I mean, it should be obvious to anybody that uh, uh, you cannot be the mother of God because God is eternally doesn't have a beginning. There's no birth of God. But when Jesus said that he came down from heaven and uh, he, uh, he did it so that he could give his life as a ransom for us to pay for our sins, uh, he had to become a man so that he could die for our sins. So he was born from Mary. I believe in the virgin birth, uh, the immaculate conception, uh, but the, but we sh cannot uh, elevate Mary to the status of that she is actually the mother of God. That started, that was never practiced in the early church. That began at 431 AD, the Council of Ephesus. Uh, then, now I'm cold.
Okay. Um, then next we have the uh, the priests began to dress differently from the laity. That started about 500 A.D. Um, the the idea of uh, the, the the way that these priests were dressed it, it's it's basically uh, no different than um, Judaism. Um, I guess Roman Roman Catholicism is kind of like uh, the the Christianity that that was originally in, mixed with um, putting your faith in Jesus and putting your faith in Judaism and practicing Judaism. Uh, so uh, that's what Roman Catholicism is also. Uh, they say they believe in Jesus, but not enough to save them. They all must also practice, do all their religious practices. So that's no different than the beginning of the church when you had this issue that Paul had to straighten out, which was that uh, you cannot retain Judaism. You've got to be, you can be a Jew if you want to, try to work your way to heaven, but you'll fail. Uh, or you can accept the fact that you can never earn salvation and instead reject Judaism, or any all religion, and instead put your faith in Jesus completely. That was the, uh, the choice that uh, Paul gave people. And but this idea of the priests dressing differently, uh, that's no different than the, the priests of uh, Judaism. I see a lot of similarities between Romanism and Judaism. Uh, they, they continue, instead of putting their faith in Jesus, can they continue practicing, doing all these religious rites. And they, then they also have a separation of the classes. And, and instead of each person just being a brother or a sister uh, in Christ, uh, they had to start this hierarchy of, of, of organizational chart uh, of authority, they, and and they had to dress differently too. Uh, so there's, I see that as nothing more than than what the, the first Jewish believers were doing, still trying to practice their religion. Uh, Then the next point would be the doctrine of purgatory was first established by Gregory the Great, 593. Just the idea of calling someone Gregory the Great. Uh, I mean, I mean that to me sounds more like uh, uh, a, a secular kind of way of thinking, like Alexander the Great. You know, he was a great conqueror, an emperor. But uh, uh, calling a pope the great, calling any uh, any Christian the great, and elevating their status. I mean, uh, Paul warned us about that. He, he said, uh, you know, don't uh, don't consider yourself uh, uh, like of Cephas or uh, of uh, uh, any teacher or even of, of Paul, but instead consider yourself of Christ. Uh, Christ is our savior, not Peter or Paul or any other uh, apostle or, or teacher. Calvinists make that mistake also, identifying themselves with a man. Uh, so the this Gregory the Great, uh, that's in 593 AD, established purgatory. Now purgatory, is not in the Bible anywhere. There's nothing in the Bible that can really support it. They do have a, a few verses that they will cite, but they, they're they totally misrepresenting the what the verses are talking about, the context and the meaning of it. There's nothing that clearly says that there's any purgatory. It's just after we die, our fate is either the second death in the lake of fire or eternal life in the kingdom of God. There's no in-between. There's no second chances to purge your sins in purgatory for a period of time so that you can be qualified for heaven. But that started in 593 A.D., and it's, uh, um, I tried reading uh, Dante's uh, 
Divine Comedies. I don't know if, if you've ever read them, but uh, he was a great critic of the popes and Romanism. And uh, he, he, his writing is, was very hard to read. Uh, if, if you have a difficult time with the KJV Bible, you certainly would have a really hard time reading Dante's writing. It's kind of like reading Shakespeare, but you know, 10 times more difficult to understand. But uh, Dante wrote a trilogy called uh, Inferno, Purgatorio, and uh, Paradiso, I think. Um, I read Inferno with great difficulty. Uh, and when I went in to read uh, uh, Purgatory, or it, it, the, the language was, it was almost like a foreign language. So I, I gave up on it. But the, the idea of Purgatory uh, is, again, it's not in the Bible. It was not taught by the early church. It was introduced in 593 AD by a pope. And the whole point was you, you're, if you, you're not going to probably go to heaven, you're going to have to go to purgatory, and therefore you need to pay us some money. Uh, light candles and make donations. Uh, you know, give your, give us your, make us your benefactors for your estate when you die. Uh, um, uh, buy indulgences, as I discussed in the past, and indulgence is a certificate that, that uh, you pay for the right to sin. Uh, and so all these things are means of getting people out of purgatory because they're going to be having their sins purged. They're suffering somehow in purgatory for who knows, maybe a day or a week or a year, or a thousand years or 10,000 years, for however long it takes to purge their sins before they can get to heaven. Those are the people who are not quite good enough Roman Catholics, I guess, so they need to have you know, spend this time in purgatory. Well, this is not a biblical. Um, if you, if you will show me any verses in the Bible that support that, uh, let me know. I, I'm familiar with the ones they use, but they, they don't support it at all. Then I'm going to look at uh, uh, the Latin language as the language of prayer and worship in churches was also imposed by Pope Gregory 1,600 years I know the first, Pope Gregory the first 600 years after Christ. So about 600 AD, um, the word of God forbids praying and teaching in an unknown tongue. That's first Corinthians 14, nine. Uh, the common people didn't know Latin or even when I was a boy going to, the Roman Catholic Mass and ca their catechism. And they, at that time, they said their Mass in Latin still. This was, see, that's the 20th century. They're still saying their Mass in Latin. Why would they do that? What possible reason would they want to speak in a language that nobody understood? Um, well, uh, they, they, I believe they wanted to keep everybody in the dark. That's why they didn't speak in the common language. And that's why they burned Bibles, because they did not want the laity to know the truth about this false religion. Because um, if they spoke in plain English and people had Bibles, they could compare with what, what the uh, Romanism was teaching them with what the scriptures said. And they see that this is not biblical at all. So, that was introduced 600 AD. Also about 600 AD, the Bible teaches that we pray to God alone. In the primitive church, never were prayers directed to Mary or to dead saints. This practice began in the Roman church. Uh, see Matthew 11, 28, Luke 1, 46, Acts 10, 25, 20, 26, and four, uh, Acts 14, Verses 14 to 18. Uh, so 
here we have scriptures that specifically tell us not to do these things, and yet uh, they introduced this about 600 AD that uh, they can actually pray and make direct their prayers to Mary or to dead saints. Now, I've had people, uh, uh, Roman Catholics, argue with me that well, they don't really do that. They're, they're not worshiping Mary or these saints. They're just... Uh, uh, um, showing respect to them and asking Mary to uh, go to God, go to Jesus and you know, on their behalf. Well, we don't need any intercessor, uh, any person. We don't need a priest between us and Jesus. We certainly don't need to go to Mary so that she can go to Jesus. You know, as, a, as a Christian, we have a direct line of communication with Christ. And, and, and Christ to the, is, is our uh, uh, advocate to the Father. So uh, if someone is praying to Mary or any dead Roman saints, uh, that's strictly forbidden in, in the Bible. Um, now, uh, about, about 610 AD, the papacy is of pagan origin. The title of Pope or Universal Bishop was first given to wicked Emperor Phocas, that's spelled P H O C A S. Uh, this he did uh, to spite Bishop Syriacus of Constantinople, who had justly excommunicated him for, for his having caused the assassination of his predecessor, Emperor. Mauritius, Gregory the First, then Bishop of Rome, refused the title, but his successor Boniface the Third first assumed title, Pope. Uh, the word Pope is not in the Bible. The concept of Pope is not in the Bible. So over and over again, we're seeing that that uh, all these teachings of Romanism have nothing to do with the Bible. It's, it's all based upon uh, Pope's ideas, man-made traditions, uh, and mixing of the Roman pagan religions with a, a little bit of, of uh, Jesus. Um, Jesus did not appoint Peter to the headship of the apostles and forbade any such notion uh, see Luke 20, chapter 22, verses 24 through 26, Ephesians 1, 22 and 20, 23, Colossians 1, 18, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Uh, the idea that, that Peter was placed in charge of, in head of the church, is uh, not biblical, and it certainly cannot be proven through any, what they call a, apostolic succession uh, from uh, from going tracing the uh, the popes all the way back to Peter who they claim was the first pope so the the word pope is not in the Bible the concept of pope in the Bible and the idea that Peter was the first pope is not in the Bible uh, there is nor is there any mention in scripture nor in history that Peter ever was in Rome much less that he was pope there for 25 years. Clement, third bishop of Rome, remarks that, quote, there is no real first century evidence that Peter ever was in Rome, unquote. So if they teach that he was the bishop of Rome. Then, 709, they introduced the practice of the kissing of the pope's feet. It had been a pagan custom to kiss the feet of emperors. The word of God forbids such practices. Read Acts 10, 25, and 26. Read Revelation 19, 10, and chapter 22, verse 9. 
that it's clear that we're not supposed to uh, worship any man, any person. We only worship God. We don't even worship angels. Angels have corrected man when uh, in the Bible, when man was bowing down and worshiping an angel. Said, no, don't worship me. Uh, the apostles, when they were worshiped by people, they said, no, don't worship me, only worship God. And yet the popes, uh, they accept the idea that their feet should be kissed as a form of worship. Uh, and again, it was a pagan custom to kiss the feet of emperors. Now, I would be in favor of the washing of feet, as Jesus gave the example, whether you're literally washing uh, other believers' feet or even a non-believer. If you're washing someone's feet, it's no different to me than just an example of, I want to serve other people. Jesus, some of the apostles were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus interrupted and said, if you, no, if you want to be the greatest, he must become the, the servant of all. And then he washed the apostles' feet to demonstrate that even he, the, the Christ, the Son of God, he would humble himself and serve people in such a way uh, of the lowly task of washing someone's feet. So, uh, yes, uh, we, we should be, uh, be wanting to serve uh, humanity. Jesus said that, you know, all the commandments are, are reduced into love God and love your fellow man. So, uh, and he said, show this love by be becoming a servant. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we uh, kiss the feet of, 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 a, of a pope. Then you've got 750 AD, the temporal power of the popes. When Pepin, the usurper of the throne of France, descended into Italy, called by Pope Stephen II to war against the Italian Lombards, he defeated them and gave the city of Rome and surrounding territory to the Pope. Jesus expressly forbade such a thing, and he himself refused worldly kingship. Read Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, and John chapter 18, verse 38. But here you have uh, the Roman Catholic religion actually uh, owning lands, owning property, acquire, accumulating wealth. And then uh, 788 AD, the worship of the cross, images and relics was authorized. This was by order of Dowager Empress Irene of Constantinople, who first caused to pluck the eyes of her own son, Constantine VI, and then called a church council at the request of Hadrian I, Pope of Rome at that time. Such practice is called simply idolatry in the Bible and is severely condemned. Uh, read Exodus chapter 20, verses 4, chapter 3, verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 15, and Psalm 115. <coughs> but uh, we, the cross is something that we, we should always remember and appreciate that Uh, Jesus suffered terribly uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane over him going to, to the cross and suffering. And he asked, Father, if you could take this cup away from me, but, but if not, your, your will be done. So <coughs> he, he knew how horrible this death would be, and yet he was faithful to willingly lay down his life so that our sins could be forgiven through his death on the cross. So 
understanding the significance of the cross, believing in the effect of his death on the cross that he paid for our sins. These are very important, but actually worshiping the cross uh, or any other historic images and relics. The Romanism has a huge collection and history of collecting religious relics and worshiping them. So that, that would be idolatry to worship these objects, these uh, whether they're man-made objects or natural objects, anything that is uh, apart from worshiping God is idolatry. Uh, that began 788 AD. And around 850 AD, the idea of holy water was introduced. Mm mixed with a pinch of salt and blessed by the priest it was authorized in 850 a.d if you're if you're not a roman catholic if you've never been one if you've never not familiar with this they have as you enter their building a right th through the doorway they have a little small bowl built into there with a um some water in it and you're supposed to dip your finger in the water and then you make this sign of the cross that I just cast earlier before you when you enter the their building and when you leave the building you do that that's their holy water and again uh, none of these things are biblical uh, if anybody watching can can show me any scriptures that supports the idea of making holy water for this purpose uh, point it out to me. I mean, I've read the Bible from cover to cover numerous times. I've studied it for 28 years. There's nothing in there that that could possibly support that practice. That's a man-made idea. Another example of this Romanism is not biblical Christianity. And then uh, 890 AD, you got the veneration of St. Joseph began. I don't know what St. Joseph, uh, uh, significance of that particular Roman saint. Uh, I'm familiar with his name. We have a school here in Las Vegas called St. Joseph's. Uh, in fact, I think there was the, the building that I went to as a kid. I try not to call it a church, but I think that was also called St. Joseph's uh, Church. Uh, but uh, I don't know who St. Joseph was, but veneration of him is, again, to venerate any person is, is uh, not biblical. Uh, we should never not only worship other people, but we should not even elevate them uh, because the body of Christ is, is supposed to be um, uh, equal uh, believers. There's not supposed to be some hierarchy established. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us there's this uh, hierarchy of, uh, of uh, government. Um, then you've got 965 AD, the baptism of bells was introduced by Pope John the 14th. I didn't look that up. I don't know what the baptism of bells is. But again, I know in the Bible, there's no such thing as the baptism of bells. So uh, you can see that, uh, you know, every few years, they come up with another man-made idea and, and, and make this part of their religious rites and practices. Um, inventions of men and then 995 a.d the canonization of dead saints first by pope john the 15th but as we said uh scriptures tell us that every believer and follower of christ is called a saint in the bible well i would correct this statement here in these notes here i would say every believer on Christ is called a saint, whether they're a follower or not. 
see, in this outline, it says every believer and follower of Christ. Well, a follower of Christ is not necessarily a believer. A follower of Christ is a disciple or a follower. But look, Judas was a follower. He was a disciple, but he was not a believer. He's not saved. So um, uh, the, the saints are uh, all the believers on Christ. And it says, read Romans 1, uh, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Uh, fasting on Fridays and during Lent were imposed, and that's 998 AD. It's a very busy period here, the end of the 10th century. They decided to introduce a lot of new uh, uh, practices. Fasting on Fridays, yes. And it, it, imposed by Pope said to be interested in the commerce of fish, bull, or permit to eat meat. Uh, uh, some authorities say began in the year 700. This is against the plain teachings of the Bible. Uh, yes, uh, Matthew 10, 15, 10, 1 Corinthians 10, 25, 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3. This tells us that we're not to forbid any of these practices. Uh, don't, don't forbid anybody to eat meat. It specifically says that. And yet, in Romanism, they're forbidden to eat meat on Friday. And then they, they said it's okay to eat fish because they were in the fishing business so they could prosper. They were going to profit from it. Now, the mass was developed gradually as a sacrifice. Attendance made obligatory in the 11th century. I talked about that earlier. The Bible teaches that the sacrifice of Christ was offered once and for all and is not to be repeated, but only commemorated in the Lord's Supper. Read Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, chapter 9, verse 26 through 28. Chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. Uh, yeah, that's all denouncing the idea of continuing to sacrifice uh, and not accepting the fact that when Jesus said it is finished, it truly is finished. No more sacrifices are needed. And if you continue doing sacrifices, that means you didn't put your faith in Jesus as a sacrifice. Then in 1079, the celibacy of the priesthood was decreed by Pope Hildebrand Boniface VII. <laughs> Priests are supposed to be celibate, they say. Well, Jesus imposed no, no such rule, nor did any of the apostles. On the contrary, St. Peter was married, a married man, and St. Paul says that bishops were to have a, have a wife and children. Read 1 Timothy 3. Uh, verses 2 and, and 5 uh, and 12. Read Matthew 8, verses 14 through 15. It's, it's amazing how so many things in Romanism, they adopt uh, a, a practice, and then in scriptures, it specifically says, don't do that. Do not uh, forbid people to eat meat. Do not forbid people to marry. And yet, in Romanism, they do exactly the opposite of what the Scripture says. How could they get away with it if people had Bibles? But at that time, people didn't have Bibles. Uh, the public didn't have them. And uh, the began being printed, a Roman Catholic religion. They were the world's leaders at burning the Bibles. They didn't want the public to know the truth, uh, or else they would see the, uh, the, the Romanism is not biblical by any means. Then you got 1090, you got the introduction of the rosary. It's a prayer bead. Prayer beads was introduced by uh, Peter the Hermit in the year 1090, copied from Hindus and Mohammedans. <coughs> yeah, you. So around 1090, so that is the end of the 11th century, they introduce the rosary. Well, have you ever seen? this practice done by Muslims? 
they have prayer beads too. And Islam started that long before as uh, Peter the Hermit introduced it into Romanism. Uh, the uh, about it was around 600 AD or 630 AD, I guess, that uh, Islam was established. And uh, in Islam, they use these prayer beads. So, and uh, according to this, Hindus also use prayer beads. But what did Jesus say say about it? He said, "Do not." Uh, pray like the heathen do using vain repetitions and that's exactly what the rosary is they have two prayers that you memorize the the lord's prayer that jesus gave us just as a guide to understand how to pray he didn't ask us to memorize it and repeat it he said pray like this so you can you know he gave us an example but not something to memorize and repeat but they so you, they memorize this Lord's prayer, and they say it, and then they'll they'll have ten more beads, and those beads designate that they'll say this Hail Mary prayer, this Hail Mary, Mother of God, and on and on. But they have to say that ten times, and then they say another Our Father's, which is basically is exactly what Jesus was condemning, saying, "Do not be like the heathens, doing vain repetitions of their prayers." A prayer should not be something memorized and repeated mindlessly that you can do without even thinking about the meaning of it. Uh, we should be praying from our from our hearts, or um, just just like I'm trying to communicate to you right now. If I was praying, I would communicate to God in the same way. I would talk to God just like I'm, I'm talking to you. Whatever my heart, my mind tells me that I'm going to say it. I'm not going to. I mean, what if, let's say that you're married, and what if you wrote down a statement to uh, say to your wife, and every single day throughout your entire marriage, every time you spoke to your wife, you just had this one paragraph memorized, and that's what you said every time. How would your, how would your uh, spouse feel about that? Say, uh, if my spouse did that to me, I think, what are, are they insane? That's, they're not communicating with me. That's mindless repetitions. Uh, you know, just you, tell me what you really think. Don't don't just repeat the same thing over and over again like an idiot. The counting of prayers is a pagan practice and is expressly condemned by Christ. That's in Matthew chapter six verses. 5 through 13, that's probably what I was referring to. Then we have in 1184, the Inquisition of Heretics was instituted by the Council of Verona in the year 1184. Jesus never taught the use of force to spread his religion. I talked about the Inquisition and the atrocities of Romanism in a previous uh, video. So you can go back and watch that where I go through the, that in great detail. The Inquisition is like, it's definitely got to be uh, one of the worst pe periods of history of mankind, the atrocities that the Roman religion has uh, imposed on uh, people, forcing them. It's very similar to what the Muslims are doing to, today in the Middle East, uh, forcing people to... Uh, denounce Jesus and put their faith in Muhammad and Islam or they'll cut their head off. Yeah. First of all, if someone says they believe under a threat like that, they don't really believe. They're just trying to spare their life. So it, it's stupid to even think that you're getting a, a believer when you try to force them like that. Uh, but in the scriptures, we, we don't see that in the Bible. We don't see jesus or the apostles uh no we we want people to become believers because uh, they were persuaded we were ready with an answer and they were persuaded they were convinced that this message of salvation this free gift of salvation that we offer them is is real and true and uh it has to be through free will not imposed by force of death or torture and then 1190, 
the sale of indulgences commonly regarded as a purchase of forgiveness and a permit to indulge in sin. I talked about that earlier, but uh, it's the whole concept is just sickening to think that you could pay to have your sins forgiven and then also pay additional so that you can go out and have a license, a literal license certificate saying you can go out and commit adultery again if you want because you've already bought that indulgence. Uh, that was introduced and then the Ro Romanism introduced that as a way of raising money. So they had monks going all over Europe, selling these indulgences, raising all kinds of money, and uh, making the Roman Catholic religion and the popes more wealthy than kings. Uh, and and then also, they, if someone didn't ag agree with Romanism, then they would torture them and kill them and steal their land. So they'd acquire more wealth by taking their property and, and, and assets. So the Roman Catholic religion has become very rich through all these practices, the sale of indulgences and the stealing of property of, of people who were not uh, Roman Catholics. Christianity is taught in the Bible condemned such a tra traffic and it was the, the protest against this traffic that brought on the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Then you have in 1215, they introduced this. The dogma of transubstantiation was decreed by Pope Innocent III uh, by this doctrine, the priest pretends to perform a daily miracle by changing a wafer into the body of Christ, and then he pretends to eat him alive in the presence of his people during Mass. The Bible condemns such absurdities, for the Lord, Lord's Supper is simply a memorial of the sacrifice of Christ, the spiritual presence of Christ is implied in the Lord's Supper. Read Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. John, chapter 6, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. They, they teach that this wafer of bread literally becomes the flesh of Jesus Christ. That, that doesn't border on insanity. It crosses over into insanity. That's not what Jesus intended. It was, he wants us to do the Lord's Supper so that we continue to memorialize and, and remember what he did. His, his body was broken, his blood, his blood was shed for, the, for our sins to be paid for. And it's a practice we should continue to do, but it's not intended to think that we're actually eating his actual body and drinking his actual blood. But they, they take it literally. Transubstantiation. That means the substance is transformed from bread into flesh. The, the wine is transformed from wine into blood. That was introduced in 1215 AD. And then also in 1215 AD, you got the confession of sin to the priest, at least once a year, was instituted by Pope Innocent III in the Lateran, Lateran Council. The Bible commands us to confess our sins direct to God. Uh, read Psalm 51, 1 through 10, Luke chapter 7, verse 48, and ch chapter 15, verse 21, and 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Uh, and confessing sins... Forget about Romanism for a second now. Just I'm just talking to you if you're a biblical Christian. Uh, we don't have to confess our sins the way some people see 1 John 1, 9. We don't have to continually confess our, our sins so that we can uh, 
continue to have new sins forgiven or so that we can uh, restore a relationship or fellowship with God? No. First uh, John 1 9 is, is saying if, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we, that is directed, that, that's talking about an unbeliever. It's, even if it's talking to a congregation of believers, if I was talking to a congregation of believers and I, and I could say to them, if we confess our sin, uh, if, if we confess that we're sinners, and, and we're, we need help. We're in trouble with God because we're sinners. And, and we confess to God, I'm a sinner. Like the, 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 the Pharisee said, not the, not the Pharisee, but the, the tax collector. You had the Pharisee boasting, look, I'm not like these other men. I do this and I do that. And then you had the Pharisee saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what First John one nine is is just acknowledging in your own mind and to God, I am a sinner. I'm I'm in a hopeless situation. I need the Savior. And if you do that one time, it's settled. Uh, but you certainly don't have to confess your sin to another person. Certainly not someone who is designated by the Roman Catholic religion as a priest. Now you don't have to confess to to them whether it's once a year or once a week or any at any time it's not biblical then we got in 1220 a.d you've got um, the adoration of the wafer or also called the host was decreed by pope honor honorius uh, so the roman church worships a god made by human hands. This is plain idolatry and absolutely contrary to the spirit of the gospel. Read John 4, verse 24. The adoration of the wafer. wafer. Uh, this little wafer or piece of bread that they believe through transubstantiation be, be, becomes the actual flesh of Jesus Christ, his body. Uh, they adore it. So um, that started in 1220. Not only is it important for you to understand all of these false teachings that are not biblical, but the fact that they were gradually introduced over a period of centuries. Uh, this is not all. When the, when the Roman Catholic religion was first established, these were not part of it. They were gradually introduced. Uh, but in the Bible, we... We know that everything about Christianity that we need to know and that is uh, the truth was it was uh, right there in the beginning. We, we don't have to get continue getting new uh, instructions from any uh, religious leader, any dictates or what they call papal bulls, orders by the Pope. Uh, now in 1229, the Bible forbidden to laymen and placed in the index of forbidden books by the Council of Valencia. 1229, they actually literally placed the Bible as a forbidden book. Why in the world would they do that? Well, because the truth is in the Bible. And if the Roman Catholic religion allowed the people to have their Bibles. It would take no time at all for them to put two and two together. That's what happened with Martin Luther. Once Martin Luther was had access to a Bible and started studying it, he realized that Romanism was contrary to the Bible. And he first tried to make the uh, make them change and conform to the, what the Bible says, and then finally he ended up leaving, leaving our Romanism completely. But that's what happens when people have their own Bible, so they uh, forbade it. 1229, it was on, placed in the index of forbidden books by the Council of Valencia. 
And then in 1287, the scapular was invented by Simon Stock, an English monk. <laughs> it is a piece of brown cloth with a picture of the Virgin and supposed to contain supernatural virtue to protect from all dangers those who wear it on naked skin. This is fetishism. Yeah. Uh, fetishism. Uh, superstition. Uh, mysticism. You can say a lot of things about it. But one thing we cannot say is, is that it's biblical. Nowhere in the Bible do we see any such such a practice. Then in 1414, the, the Romanism forbade the cup to the laity by instituting the communion of one kind in the Council of Constance. So in other words, before that, the layperson would get the bread and they'd have the wine, just as we're instructed to do uh, uh, when we read the, the account uh, in, in Matthew uh, 26 in 1 Corinthians 11. When we read the account of the Lord's Supper, the instructions tell us that we are to eat the bread. Remember that his body was broken for us his, and drink the wine or the grape juice, remembering that his blood was shed for us, for our sins. And yet in 1414, they said, no, the Pope gets the, all the wine, not the Pope, the priest gets all the wine. The lay people, you can have the bread and you, you should better adore it. It's because it's actually transformed into the real flesh of Jesus. But the blood, no, you can't have that. Only the priest gets the blood. So they took this wine away from the layperson in 1414. The doctrine of purgatory was proclaimed as a dogma of faith by Council of Florence. That's 1439. There's not one word in the Bible that would teach the purgatory of priests. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Read 1 John 1, 7 through 9, 2, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, John 5, verse 24, Romans 8, 1, on and on. We see that uh, all our sins are forgiven when we put our faith in Jesus, past, present, and future sins. There is no need to go into this place called purgatory where the, our sins are being purged from us uh, over a period of time through some kind of suffering. So that was invented and introduced into Romanism in 1439. Also in 1439, the doctrine of the seven sacraments was affirmed. Um, the Bible says that Christ instituted only two ordinances, uh, baptism and Lord's Supper. But the, in Romanism, they've got seven sacraments. I tried to remember them all uh, recently, but I know that they've got the baptism, which is infant baptism, sprinkling of water on an infant. And uh, baptism is supposed to be done uh, after someone uh, understands the gospel and puts their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, then they should make a public statement saying, I'm a Christian and I publicly want to acknowledge it. Let me be baptized just as uh, the Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, uh, now that I believe, is there any reason I can't be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with your whole heart, it's okay to be baptized. So we should be baptized, uh, but it's a way of publicly saying, I am a Christian and I'm being dunked in the water, symbolic of my death with Christ. And I'm being raised out of the water, symbolizing the resurrection of Jesus and 
my resurrection into eternity, into glory. Um, but they, so they got these seven sacraments. They start off with infant baptism, which uh, accomplishes nothing. An infant is incapable of understanding any of this. And then you've got uh, the catechism where you've got to learn the, these, I, all these teachings of Romanism. And, and then you're ready to go to confession. You confess to the priest, which we've already discussed is not biblical. And then now that you, he forgave your sins, now that you can go and, and, and eat the actual literal um, flesh of Jesus through their uh, transubstantiation. And then next, uh, at certain age, they allow you to get confirmed where you're saying, okay, uh, I know that I was baptized as an infant, but now that I'm old enough to understand all this, I confirm that I am a truly Roman. I believe in this or Roman Catholic religion. Uh, and then the other sacrament is marriage. And then they have the last rites. I think there's one that I'm missing. So if someone knows what the other one is, let me know. Um, the last rites is just as, as, as someone is on their deathbed about to die, the priest comes and make sure that there are all their final sins are forgiven so they don't die with any sins on them. Um, of course, that's not biblical either because uh, we know that when the day you put your faith in Jesus at that very moment, every sin you did in the past and every sin you will do in your future until your last breath, it was all, it's all paid for and sin is no longer an issue between you and God. Uh, the only issue was that remained is uh, will you re receive the gift of eternal life? And when you put your faith in Jesus, that's what you get. You get eternal life, the promise of eternal life in the kingdom of God. There's no need for these seven sacraments of Romanism. That was uh, affirmed in 1439. And then in uh, 1508, the Ave Maria, Part of the last, uh, it was completed 50 years afterward and finally approved by Pope Sixtus V at the end of the 16th century. The Ave Maria. I don't even know what the Ave Maria is. I know there's a song, Ave Maria. Perhaps this is another way of them worshiping or uh, uh, you know, uh, putting Mary on a pedestal. And then you got... Uh, in 1545, the Council of Trent, held in the year 1545, declared that tradition is of equal authority with the Bible. Hmm. So in other words, all of these things that we I've cited today, that the popes have laid down as orders, new doctrines, have become the traditions of the church. They're not in the Bible. But it's what a pope said. And then in 1545, they decree that anything that the pope said, all these traditions, they have equal authority with the, with the scriptures. Even though it's not in the scripture, it's equally valid. By tradition is meant human teachings. The Pharisees believed the same way, and Jesus bitterly condemned them. Uh, for by teaching human tradition, they nullified the commandments of God. Read Mark chapter 7, verse 7 through 13, Colossians 2, verse 8, and Revelation 22, 18. Um, I'm going to stop it right here only because my back is getting very tired. So uh, there's still a lot to go, uh, a lot more doctrines to discuss. So I'll have to make a note I stopped here uh, on the traditions, 1545. Uh, and I'll pick this up next week uh, where I left off. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground today, and there's a lot more uh, tenets of Romanism that are non-biblical. So what you have to ask yourself is, are you going to believe what the Bible says, or are you going to believe the teachings of the popes and the traditions of the popes or traditions of men instead of the scriptures. Because many of these things are not found in the Bible. And then many of them, they are found in the Bible, but the Bible says don't do it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? 
They come up with all these teachings that are not biblical. Uh, they invent them. And then they find things in the Bible. The Bible actually is specific, uh, saying, don't forbid marriage. And then they go around and forbidding marriage. Don't forbid people to eat meat. And then they forbid people to eat meat. Don't pray vain repetitions. And then they invent the rosary and do vain repetitions. It seems like they're going out of their way to do exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. So you cannot be a biblical Christian in a Roman Catholic. Okay, so that'll be it for today. Uh, I want to leave you one thought. If if you're a Roman Catholic or if you're someone who's never um, become what I call a believer, I'm going to tell you how to do it right now. Uh, I've mentioned it already and alluded to it quite a bit in this uh, talk today, but it's it's the simple. Uh, Jesus said, uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Uh, so this is simple, it's easy. Uh, the only thing that's required of you is to transfer your faith off of yourself and put your faith on Jesus instead. Because right now, uh, you might believe in God. You might even believe in Jesus uh, in a certain extent. Uh, but you're, if I asked you why you think you're going to go to heaven and why, what are you going to say? If your answer is the typical religious answer that, well, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven or I hope I'm going to go to heaven, I got my fingers crossed hoping I'm good enough. Um, I do this, I do that, I fast, I give to charity, I attend church, I do that. If you are putting your faith in what you do, then you're lost. Because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The, the, no one is righteous, not even one. The, 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 the very best of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. Don't put your faith in what you do. Understand that everything you do means nothing to God in terms of your salvation. If you want salvation, you need to put your faith in what Jesus did. And he did it because he knew you couldn't do it. He knew you were incapable of living a perfect life, so he came and lived a perfect life. He knew that you would have to pay for your sins, but he loved you so much he came so he could die and pay for your sins so you wouldn't have to. And then he raised himself from the dead, proving that he is God. He has the power over life and death. And he promises you life everlasting if you put your faith on him instead of yourself. So I'm asking you now, put no faith in yourself. Put no faith in your practicing of a religion. Not even 1% faith in yourself. Move your faith completely off of yourself and instead put 100% of your faith completely on Jesus. And when you do that, he quickens you. He takes your spirit, which is, Scripture says, we're dead spiritually until we get born again. When you put your faith in Jesus, he quickens you. Your spirit is brought to life. Jesus puts his spirit, the Holy Spirit, in you. Your spirit's connected to God's spirit, and you're alive, and you have this connection to God now. And the Holy Spirit lives inside you. And scriptures say that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. The Spirit will never leave you. Scripture says that you, at that point, you've become a child of God. And Jesus has promised you, you're going to have eternal life. You'll be resurrected after you die. When he calls for the resurrection, you'll be resurrected with a perfect body that will never get sick or old or die or suffer again. And you'll live like that in paradise, in the kingdom of God forever, simply because you put your faith in Jesus, not in yourself. Will you do it? If you do put your faith in Jesus today, please make a comment and let me know. I'd, I'd love to celebrate. So thank you for watching. And 
We'll pick up where we left off next Sunday. Uh, bless you. And now that you put your faith in Jesus, rest, rest in this arms of Jesus, in this love and grace of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.